Hello and welcome to Sprott Radio. I'm your host, Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Partner at Sprott Asset Management. Pleased today to welcome back Per Jandir, Director at WMC, for part two of our most recent podcast on uranium. Per, thanks again for joining Sprott Radio. Uh, thanks for having me back, Ed. Feels like it wasn't that long ago, but a lot of stuff has happened, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a timely update. Yes and yes. You know, since our last conversation, several key producers have offered some production guidance. Can you talk about that and, and what that may mean for investors? Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, because we had kind of the, the warning from Kazadon Prom that came out in January, and there was a bit of a market response to that. Obviously, Kazadon Prom said they were going to ramp up production in one of their uh, press releases in early October last year, I believe. And then now, a few months later, they say that the, well, it's actually going to be quite challenging. There's a shortage of sulfuric acid. And uh, then provided some numbers on that in a call in early February. So it turns out that there is only going to be a marginal increase. Originally, they said they were going to ramp up by by 10%, but it seems like it's more or less going to be flat for this year. So that's going to be a, a shortfall of, you know, seven, eight million pounds, which is fairly significant. So the market did react to that. I thought actually the reaction was going to be stronger than it was, but still it's a fairly significant shortfall. And I think it'll be interesting to follow this year how that's going to play out because I think it will impact the market at some point. It hasn't really done it just yet, but I think it will be, become more obvious as the year goes forward here, how, what impact uh, that's going to have on the market. So interesting to follow, but, but that was, uh, there was always the news from Casadon Prom. And I think the shortfall was bigger than people expected. So that's why you had a bit of a uptick in, uh, in equities for sure anyway. And then a week later, it was Chemical's turn. Obviously, a large Canadian miner came out with their news release. And I think there has been a lot of sort of rumors spread beforehand. And there was a lot of maybe generalist money or new money to the secondary cane and thought like, oh, there's going to be another shortfall from this big producer. The market's going to spike. So there was a lot of people positioned for that. But Cameco did not disappoint. They're a very good production company. They, uh, they did not have a shortfall, just a minor one from, from last year. So I think think that the market overall was disappointed in that, whereas I don't think anyone really in the physical market or on the utility side was too surprised. But it did, however, have a very big impact on equities, and it was a very red day across the board. Certainly a lot of volatility. There was talks of potentially hedge funds coming in and playing short-term uh, maturity options on that as well. So that sort of added to a little bit of the action and volatility around that. But it seems anyway, a lot of that sort of fast money has kind of came in and, and has now been flushed out. So it's, uh, but it's been a couple of weeks and it's obviously been pretty choppy on the equity side and it has spilled over a little bit on the, uh, on the, in the spot market as well. Well, and let's talk about that volatility because I guess the most recent price was, you know, around what, 106, 107 um, in the last month or two. And, and where is spot trading now? What, what, what kind of price are we looking at? Yeah, it's, I think today we're at uh, 95. Okay. It's been there for a couple of days now. There was a, was a dip uh, last Friday, depending on that would be towards the end of February when there was a $5 drop in the market, but it was on basically no volume. There was no trades that day. The last trade before that was 101 and then absolutely nothing traded, but there was pretty aggressive offers in the market, even though there was no actual transaction. Those offers alone drove down the price about $5. After close, there was a couple of transactions at 94 and 95. But since then, it's been very quiet too. Right now, we're looking at a spread of uh, three, four dollars. So it's been very, very quiet. And I think it obviously it's been a very sharp move from from 60 to 107 dollars over six months. And now it's a bit of a pullback, even though it's basically on no volume whatsoever. People are trying to find out where the market is. There's been Big fundamental news in the market. In my view, I'm surprised. I thought actually the spot price would be higher uh, than what it is now. So whether you want to see that as a purchase opportunity or whether it's we're going to sit here for a bit. My personal view is that as much production has been sort of disappeared from this year because of the challenges that uh, that Kassadon Prom have, I think that tightness is going to shine through a little bit later on. But yeah, the year will tell. So uh, we'll see. Right now we're sitting at 95, which is of course higher when, when, than when the year closed, uh, last year closed anyway. So we're still up on the year, but I still think uh, there's a fair bit of upside on this anyway, but time will tell. That's a great point that you just made that we're still up on the year. And as people invest in these things longer term, going from 60 to 107 and then 107 down to 95, 
that seems to be pretty typical. You know, forgetting the announcements and what's going on, that's a, that's a typical kind of ebb and flow in, in an investment. So the fact that it's still up for the year, I think, speaks volumes of that. And, and let's talk about that for a second. As these announcements come out, and I'm not sure if any smaller producers announced or if it had any significance, but as that continues to kind of play itself out in the market, in your mind, does this change the midterm or long-term outlook for uranium? Considering the, the, the challenges that the really good, the really big producers are having, and, and mining is not easy. So if they're struggling, well, clearly that means like everybody's going to be struggling. So I think if nothing else, the supply shortage is just going to be extended and there is no clear relief in sight. When is this relief going to come? It, it's years out. So we're looking at a, at a structural supply deficit that is going to run for years to come. I think the, the takeaway for us is prices are going to be higher for longer. That's essentially it. And I was just at a conference in, in Florida for the last few days here, a big investor conference in commodities. And, and it's quite clear that like at these prices, you have smaller uranium companies. There is renewed interest in them because at these prices, it will be easier for them to raise capital for their projects. So there is a supply response, but it's, it's years out in time. But, it, but at least it's a healthy sign that they're starting to move on this anyway. But it's also not a concern necessarily, but it's clearly for someone who's doing the research on the supply demand picture that the big suppliers, they're very good companies, they're good at what they do, but it's not a given that they're going to be able to produce exactly as much as they want to do. Or if they choose not to produce and just have less supply in the market, and obviously they can, prices will probably go up and we capture revenue that way. It's a little unclear what's going on. It's not a simple story mm -hmm. anyway. So it's definitely worth doing some due diligence on, on your own and just try to get the supply demand picture clear in your head and form your own view. So it's a very interesting time in the market, but I also think we're starting to see healthy responses on the supply side. But also those are quite a few years out. Given the prices are sitting in this like 95 range, and we've talked about this you know, over the last year or two, at what price point do new producers come in or do, at what price point do new mines get discovered or developed? Are we starting to see that at all? Are you seeing that kind of the news flow now? Are you seeing that, hey, we're sitting in this 90 to $100 range. This can be profitable if you and I decide to go into the mining business tomorrow. Or is that still too soon? There's definitely noise. Like the juniors are starting to get more attention, which is obviously a healthy sign. And I think most mines will be profitable at the $100 a pound. But if the price is $150 a pound, no mines will come to the market faster anyway. It's more of a time constraint, mm -hmm. and that's not going to solve itself. We're going to be in a, in a deficit for quite some time, and we'll see where the price ends up during this period. Of course, utilities, they're still active in the market with RFPs, even though the spot activity itself has slowed down here for a few weeks. It will pick back up. As we come into March, April, I think uh, the spot activity is probably going to pick back up, and then we'll, we'll have to take it from there. You know, I was going back and rereading some of our podcasts and utilities is becoming a common theme that with two years ago, we didn't really talk about it that much. Anything changing there? Are you seeing more companies come in? Are they going for longer term contracts? Spend a few minutes on that if you don't mind. Most of the utilities, they contract in the term market. It's bilateral negotiations. It's very opaque. I mean, the spot market in uranium is opaque in its own, but then you add right. the term market is, is a, few, a, few, a few trips more opaque than that even. So it, it's very, very hard to get a sense for what's going on. There is a, what's called a term price published that is sort of reflecting what's the base escalator price. So this is a price that sort of agreed to today, but you're not thinking of taking delivery for another three, four years out wow. in time. And the duration has to be for at least four or five years. And today's uh, escalation rates, you know, they're going to be five, six percent something, right? So even if the, and the price itself, I think is 75 last published now. So of course you're going to escalate that for three, four years at five, six percent. It's not 75, it's something completely different. Mm -hmm. And also the big producers will be the first ones to tell you that we're not agreeing to any fixed or base escalated prices either. What we're looking for now is, is market exposure. So then what's more interesting is, is the floors and the ceilings in these index related prices. And I think Cameco at their most recent call said that they are writing $130 ceilings and mm -hmm. about $70, $75 floors. Go back about six months ago and then that number was $50 and $80 ceilings. So now we're at 75 and 130. So that's clearly a reflection of whatever the spot price environment is, is going to have a, an impact on what these 
terms in the long-term contracts are. Mm -hmm. It seems like an option trader's dream <laughs> to get this kind of movement in the market. So I suspect Wall Street's taking notice to this. Are you noticing that at all when you go to these conferences? Are you seeing more non-utility, uh, non-producers sort of walking around? You're seeing more of a Wall Street presence these days, given all this activity? No, because it's very hard for, I think, for investment companies to, to have a frank discussion with, with utilities because there's simply not that many touching points. Okay. I mean, we're obviously interacting with them because we're taking in these tenders and on the contract. So we know what's being contracted, but unless you're in that physical supply market, you're not really going to see these things. But some of them become a little bit more public. Like there is a very large tender that just came out from a European utility for over 20 million pounds for a delivery period of 14 years. They don't happen very often. So uh, so this is clearly something the market is noticing, and but it's nothing that has a direct impact in the spot market, but it clearly is an indication on that utilities are very active contracting at this moment. It's amazing looking out 14 years. I mean, any given day, you're not thinking about 14 minutes of <laughs> what the market's going to do. So uh, certainly a different environment for sure. Well, you know, I have to ask you also, because every time I see you uh, on a video screen, you seem to be someplace different. What's going on from the road? Where are you now and where are you headed? You know, what's, what's you know, the next couple of weeks or months look like for you as far as activity is concerned? Well, I used to live in Cape Town, South Africa, so I always go there every year. But uh, but I also was there for uh, a big mining conference called Indaba and uh it just happened to coincide with some of my vacation, but I have some meetings there too. And at these price levels, African projects are very interesting. So there's definitely activity there too. It's not just in Kazakhstan. It's not just in Canada or in the US. It's very much in Africa as well. It's good to see that there are global projects and they're, they're very interested and we're going to need them. We're going to need them all, even though if all the big projects that all the analysts are forecasting are going to come online, by 2030, we'll still be at a, at a deficit. And then uh, after my vacation there, I just went to the big Bank of Montreal uh, Metals and Mining Conference in, in Florida. And uh, it's one of the most impressive conferences I think uh, I've ever been to. It's 2,000 people. We got all the, the best in the business are all there. We had about 40 meetings in, in two and a half days. It's like speed dating. You get a lot of information. You, you answer a lot of questions, of course, as well. It's very interesting to see. And it's funny, it's supposed to third year we were there now and uh, John Champagne and I were laughing that the first year we went there was no panel discussion on uranium no one really cared the <laughs> second year there was a lunch or sorry a breakfast and it was like 7 a.m you know it was like a few tired people sitting drinking coffee barely taking notes and this time around we had a lunch panel and it was it was a packed room it was a standing room only almost uranium has definitely shifted in the in the attention span but it's also one of the best performing commodities so it, it is doing really well and we see a lot of a lot of new investors that are quite new to the space and and they're rotating in obviously at, at spot we started at 25 30 dollars and people are quite happy with the money they made more than quite a few uh, that we met with said that uh, you know uranium saved my portfolio last mm -hmm. year and now they're taking some profit and i quite frankly i don't blame them and we're seeing days where you have you know 100 200 million dollars trade in, in spot it's great to see because it's a lot more liquid than the spot market you know by multiples almost 10x sometimes and we're also seeing new interest entering the market at the equivalent of 90 dollar uranium so there is definitely still interest and people realize we're, we're early on and they do a quick analysis and they realize that yeah this uh, this supply problem is not going to solve itself anytime soon so so it's a, it's a very interesting outlook for the market. And actually, the, one of the, the more profound moments I had at this conference was that I was a Swiss uranium trader. He's been in the business since about 20 years at least. So he was there for the last spike. And he's like, yeah, everybody makes the comparison to 2007, uh, where we are right now. And it's like, this is not 2007. This is, this is 1970. When the, the birth of nuclear energy, when you had a decade-long bull market, because of the, because of all the ramp ups and all the demand increase and like that's the kind of demand increase we're seeing now in 2007 there was no demand increase there was a supply shortage short term and then the Kazakhs ramped up and chemical deflooded Cigar Lake and got that back up and running but it's a completely different setup and he's like I'm drawing much more parallels to 1970 than 2007 which is it's uh, it's quite an eye opener. So that says something about this thesis for for this market. That's a an amazing statement you just made because it just we're sort of back to the future here as far as looking at 
the opportunity, the price. And you said something I think that's really interesting. People are taking profits who were early, who were sort of the sleepy-eyed person in the conference a year, year and a half ago, two years ago, having coffee, listening to you guys have a morning session. And now new people are entering the market at 95. And to your point, even at 95, this looks like a very attractive allocation given the long-term outlook. Is that fair to say? Is that it's just sort of it's stair-stepping up? Am I hearing that correctly, I guess, is the question. Uh, spot on. That's exactly what it is. They're looking at all the new reactors being announced, uh, projects having life extensions, being the decommissionings being reversed, talk of SMRs. You know, this, this is a multi-decade development story mm-hmm. we're seeing in nuclear energy, and, and we're only in the beginning of it, and we're at $95. If you inflation adjust that price spike in the 70s I was talking about, you're ending up at $175, $200 for a decade. When you look at the price sensitivity of the fuel cost of nuclear energy, it's actually very, very low. So there's no demand destruction going on at the $100, $150, even $200 a pound. It's something that you definitely can handle as, a, as an operator of a nuclear power station. So it's a very, very interesting time in the market. Pair, I always look forward to seeing you and hearing your thoughts on what's going on in uranium. And if there's anything out there you'd want to leave us with, we're all ears. Keep an eye on uh, the potential sanctions, U.S. sanctions on on Russian supply. That's something that can certainly trigger uh, some more price movement. Mm -hmm. And other than that, just see on on production updates from the big suppliers and just uh, keep an eye on the spot market because I think we'll, uh, we'll see some movement for sure. It's a fun time in industry, but it's also if you do your due diligence, there are some very good investments opportunities. Well, we'll certainly drag you back on here at some point this year. I'll be looking forward to hearing kind of how the the summer shapes up. Maybe we'll get you back on in the fall to talk a bit more about this. So, you know, I always encourage people to to check out what you guys are doing over at WMC. You guys do a phenomenal job as far as really having your hand on the pulse. So I tell people all the time to go check out WMC Group dot com to learn more about what's going on with not just your firm but really what's happening in the energy market and, and in uranium in particular so as always you know pair thank you for making the time today to uh, talk to us on sprout radio thanks a lot ed i'm happy to come back anytime awesome and once again i'm ed coin and thank you for listening to sprout radio this podcast is provided for information purposes only from sources believed to be reliable However, Sprott does not warrant its completeness or accuracy. Any opinions and estimates constitute our judgment as of the date of this material and are subject to change without notice. Past performance is not indicative of future results. This communication is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any financial instrument. Any opinions and recommendations herein do not take into account individual client circumstances, objectives, or needs, and are not intended as recommendations of particular securities, financial instruments, or strategies. You must make your own independent decisions regarding any securities, financial instruments, or strategies mentioned or related to the information herein. This communication may not be redistributed or retransmitted in whole or in part or in any form or manner without the express written consent of Sprott. Any unauthorized use or disclosure is prohibited. Receipt and review of this information constitutes your agreement not to redistribute or retransmit the contents and information contained in this communication without first obtaining express permission from an authorized officer of Sprott.